Hello, I'm Richard Pena, professor of film studies at Columbia University, and I'm here at the Quad Cinema in New York City for the Cohen Media Channel to introduce a program by two of my favorite filmmakers, the Taviani brothers from Italy. When we talk about Italian cinema, very often Italian neorealism, that very important, very influential movement that began in the mid-1940s, becomes kind of the watershed. Everything is either a lead up to that or a sort of move away from it or a return to it or something like that. All of Italian film history seems to be seen through or filtered through the prism of Italian neorealism. In a certain way, the Taviani's haven't been any different. They themselves were brought to the cinema by their admiration for neorealist works. They've mentioned especially the tremendous impact of the work of Roberto Rossellini on the two of them when they were young men and decided that they would go into cinema. And in a way, one could say that their films follow generally along the lines of realism as it was determined by the Italian neorealists. That is, shooting in real locations, often using non-actors, an emphasis on natural as opposed to artificial light, all of those things. But frankly, of course, by the time the Taviani's were working, many of these things had just been really assumed into filmmaking. They became part of everybody's film language, so they no longer had that specificity. What, for me, brings the Taviani's closer to the neorealists is the neorealists were really that movement or that group that really began to reflect on the process of storytelling. Cinema, of course, had developed by the mid-1940s, especially in Hollywood, a very kind of well-structured, conventional approach to telling stories, you know, beginning, middles, and ends, strong protagonists, all those kinds of things. But the neorealists came along and introduced films that were often more ambiguous. Uh, the films didn't really end. If you think of The Bicycle Thief, for example, the man at the end just walks into a crowd. We have no idea what happens to him. Where they end ambiguously, you're not really sure what happened or what you're supposed to think about it. So there was a way in which the neorealists open up that process of storytelling to further reflection. And this is where I think the Taviani's come in. For the works especially that we're about to see, they're films that really look at film or storytelling from the point of view of something like memoir, something like legend, and something like myth all different kind of registers of storytelling that I think they explore in the three films that are in this package, along with other modes of storytelling, if you see more of their works. Because indeed, I think they're always people who have been very conscious of the fact of not only telling stories, but how films are interpreted within different formats. The first film that's part of this package is the film that really establishes the uh, Taviani's reputation, and that's Padre Padrone from 1977, a film that went on to win the grand prize at Cannes in that year and then went on to become a big international hit. This is a film that's based on a memoir, a memoir specifically of a man named Gavino Leda from Sardinia. Leda was a kind of remarkable character who became an important linguist in Italy, especially writing about the origins of the peculiar Sardinian dialect of Italian, but had been a largely illiterate shepherd up until the age of 18. So the film is really about his break away from his family, his move to the mainland to get an education, and, to, and also about how that went on to sort of form the basis for his career. Yet there are sort of two stories going on at the same time. The memoir that's uh, recounting to us the action, and then the other memoir, which is the coming into consciousness, if you will, of Gavino Leda. It's very interesting to see how the film really gives us these two stories simultaneously. The one that's best known, of course, is his struggle against his father. His father was a very harsh man, as harsh as the landscapes in which the whole family lived, who, for various reasons, mainly I think out of fear, did everything he could to control his family. And that meant denying his son the chance for an education. He very much worked against the idea of his son ever leaving that area and going off and becoming educated, made fun of him for it, tried to forbid him from doing that. Yet beyond that, there's the sort of self-liberation of Gavino himself, how he comes to terms with who he is, how he learns to accept his own thought, his own intelligence. 
you know, the idea of someone really coming to the moment where he realizes that he can do things, that his brain is part of what defines him. It's a beautiful moment in the film where he becomes part of a sort of radio construction program uh, as part of the Italian military. And you see this wonderful moment where he has to construct a radio and then the instructor comes along and turns it on to make sure it works. And suddenly when it comes on and it plays this very lovely classical music and you feel this kind of incredible sense of accomplishment. It's almost as if he's come into being because he's been able to fully use his mind, his brain, his whole being to kind of construct this project. Project. Padre Pedroni is a very, very moving film, and as I said, these two parts, the sort of coming into consciousness of, Algu of Galvino as a person and the struggle against the father, really are the two sides of the coin. People especially pay attention to the second story, partially because the father is played by a magnificent actor, uh, Omero Antonuti, who worked a lot with the Taviani brothers, and he becomes a real terrifying figure of kind of male patriarchal authority. But the Tavianis are far too great as artists and I think as people to simply paint him as a villain. They give him a kind of complexity and they show that this feeling of fear, if you will, of the son stepping outside of the designated role he has in that society really comes at its heart from a kind of caring, from a kind of love. As warped as we might think that love is, it's a very real love. And I think the film really captures that along with the brutality at the same time. This is a much loved film, and if you haven't seen it, you're in for a real treat. The second film, The Night of Shooting Stars, sometimes called The Night of San Lorenzo, that's the Ita Italian title, is really a film that one could say really comes from the point of view of legend. By that, it's a story that's been told so often that one is no longer truly sure what happened or what didn't happen, what has been embellished over time. The basic film is set at a moment that, up until the point when this film was made, which was the early 1980s, had not really been covered much in Italian cinema. And that's that period from about 1943 till about 1945, when in fact Italy became a major battleground in World War II between the Germans, who had invaded the country and tried to occupy it after the overthrow of Mussolini, and of course the Americans, who were coming up through the South and trying to liberate the country. In between, of course, were these Italian communities, very often peasant or farming communities, that in a way were victims of both or saw themselves as kind of almost strangers in their own country because, in fact, they were fighting against these forces that were both foreign or equally foreign to them and they were just trying to find a means to survive. The film is told to us as a kind of bedtime story, as a woman, now in her middle age, recounts the story of her childhood to a sleeping child who, in fact, we only see at the end of the film. And it's very, very beautiful how the film incorporates the whole idea of telling, of memory, of these historical events as they might be filtered through the memory of a child. There are many wonderful pieces in the film. There are a lot of fragmentary stories because, of course, this young woman would only see part of what was going on and not all of it and often not understand what she was seeing. But the set piece that everyone always points to in this film is one in which these villagers, having been driven out of their, their hometown, are seeking refuge in a field. And suddenly that field becomes a light with a firefight between Italian fascists, the groups that are still remaining from the old government, and local partisans. And it's a kind of really terrifying battle, one of the scariest I know of in cinema, because it's just tall grass and people are sort of popping up all over the place. It's very, very effective as just a, a piece of wartime combat footage in a way, but also remarkable because there's this character of a young fascist boy with a beautiful angelic face who just keeps, you know, in a certain way encouraging his father to shoot more people. Again, uh, the kind of thing that works best in a sort of legend as opposed to a kind of historical account it becomes one of those figures that almost seems like a little demon who inserts himself into this story. The film ends as it begins, as a kind of fairy tale in a way, or as a kind of bedtime story, and it shows how our memory of history is often very much caught up in, and in a sense influenced by the way that that history is told. 
again, a beautiful film and one I think you'll enjoy very much. The last film that's in this set of films by the Taviani brothers is the film that many critics, myself included, uh, consider their masterpiece, and that's a film called Chaos. The film is based on a series of short stories by the great Italian writer Luigi Pirandello. And like in Pirandello's work, there's a kind of sense of self-consciousness about the entire project that especially comes out at the end. The way in which these stories are, on the one hand, stories happening to actual people, people we see from these communities in Sicily, and at the same time, these stories stand for much more than that. They're myths in the sense they explain certain aspects of contemporary Italian life and culture through the sort of daily lives, the daily incidents that happen to a group of unconnected people. The first one, perhaps my favorite, is called The Other Son, and it's a film about a woman who is writing a letter to her son who has emigrated a long time ago to the United States, and she's hoping to give the letter to the next group of locals who are about to abandon their home territory for the great unknown that is America. It's a very, very moving section because it really goes into the whole question of immigration, the whole question of what is home, what is family, what are connections like that. It really shows how so many of those definitions really became uprooted and, in fact, overturned in the course of the last century. And I think Pirandello's story captures that so beautifully, the idea of many of the sort of uh, expectations that one can have in terms of life or family, whatever, simply no longer makes sense in a world in which one can move to uh, another land thousands of miles away and start a new life. All of the stories have that aspect to it, something that seems like a very small incident that takes on a much larger resonance in a way. So it becomes, again, a sort of myth about modern life. The last part of the film, certain way the, the most interesting and the ones that the Taviani's really kind of created themselves, involves a conversation between Pirandello, played by their favorite actor, Omero Antonuti, going back to his hometown to have a conversation with his mother, who is long passed on, about the kinds of stories that he writes. And it's almost as if one feels that Pirandello is asking for permission from some authorities in some beyond land to continue to work in this way, to sort of address those sort of ineffable issues, those unseen issues with these very human, very earth-level kinds of narratives that he so excelled at writing. It's really a marvelous film, three hours long, but every moment is really worth it. One feels the Taviani's were at the absolute top of their craft and the acting, the cinematography, the beautiful music by Nicola Pavoni and others just make it a, a true masterpiece of the 1980s, a film I know you'll enjoy very much. All three films are, I think, gems in their way. All of them show the kind of breadth of the art of the Tavianis and also show their incredible attention and indeed care for these stories of very common people, never condescending always showing people and their lives with the kind of complexity that they deserve to be portrayed with. I know you'll enjoy the show. It's a wonderful package of films, and I hope you'll, from here, go on to see other films by the Tavianis as well. They truly are among the most important film artists of the last 50 years. I'm Richard Pena from Columbia University, and for their Cohen Media Channel, thank you for watching, and now enjoy the show.